Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. Hello and welcome to Naked Reflections. When it comes to learning and education, there's always been a tension between the need for discipline and the requirement for skepticism. The balance between these two approaches has ebbed and flowed over the centuries and continues to do so. But perhaps you can't have one without the other. Discipline is our subject this week and I'd urge skeptical listeners to Naked Reflections to remember that. Discipline, you might say, starts at home. Here's an extract from an article by Priya Crosby on the Naked Scientist website, summarizing the findings of a report by Yvonne Kelly. Boys and girls without regular bedtimes, the team found, performed less well in academic tests than individuals who had a more regular schedule. Girls who experienced unusually late or unusually early bedtimes after 9pm or before 7.30pm also had reduced academic performance which was on par with children with irregular bedtimes. With me to discuss discipline, I have Julian Stanley of the Clear Thinking Consultancy. Julian helped launch the Educational Support Partnership, which gives wide-ranging advice to schools, colleges and universities. He's just been appointed CEO of Transitions UK, a charity devoted to young people and issues of mental health. And joining us is the Wolf Institute alumnus, Dr Austin Tiffany whose PhD thesis was entitled Pedagogies and Practice. Austin worked for the International Community of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, supporting Christian churches there, which I suspect required a lot of discipline, and is now director of the Good Faith Partnership, which is devoted to civil society and the common good. Julian, you're someone who's been involved in educational theory. I doubt if the findings in that clip surprised you. Not really, and I, I think most of us would probably agree that discipline is a necessary requirement to have an orderly society and to be able to live uh, lives in a relatively peaceful and calm manner. And I guess we're really all about trying to regulate our own emotions and feelings and to translate that into the kind of behaviours that can be helpful to us as we kind of participate in wider society. So things change and certainly in relation to schools there's a massive difference today from my generation when I went to school in the 60s. Back in the day. Back in the day and you know quite marked difference. So I think progress has been made and discipline's a key and vital issue to crack. So Austin, do you think that um, good discipline in childhood translates into good habits in later life? I think I largely agree with that, but you know, I'm coming from a fairly unique perspective. Uh, well, not unique, but different, in that I grew up in rural Texas. One of the main things I think about is actually in terms of dress. So I found it really shocking when I first came to the UK and that there was kind of this disciplinary dress code. You need to dress in a certain way and you do that, you know, all your years of education. And I remember many times growing up that this was brought, you know, to a vote uh, in my hometown, you know, should we implement a dress code? And always it got struck down massively. No one wanted it. And part of it was because so many parents said this is an opportunity for kids to express themselves. It has a problem, especially in economically diverse schools. You know, it's very clear all at once who the rich kids are and who the kids from struggling families are. But at the same time, I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed kind of wearing my identity on my sleeve. And and I think that school gave me the context of discipline while still allowing me to be creative in some way. Very interesting. I mean, I sit on a board of, um, of United Learning Academy Trust, one of the largest in the country. And in the schools, generally, they have a uniform policy. And I was brought up with uniform policy. And we all hated wearing a uniform. And the big thing was to get to, you know, the age when you were around about 14 or 15, and you got to wear different colour jumpers as you kind of pr progress through the school, which was seen as a really cool thing to have happen. But uh, so much time was wasted around uniform. Uniform. It's quite interesting culturally. You know, you'd get sent home if you had the wrong colour socks on and, you know, you kind of think to yourself, well, actually, isn't that a waste of teaching and learning time? 
But I think the cultural point is quite interesting because I think in different cultures, the way in which we view discipline or we view uh, conformity or non-conformity is very different. So, you know, you talked about obviously being in Jerusalem and being in parts of the Middle East where it would be completely different. I, I suppose if we take discipline and the meaning of it, I guess it's, you know, it's, I think the Latin is, it's meant, comes from the Latin word and it's meant to teach and to instruct. But I think we associate discipline a lot of the time with punishment. And certainly, certainly at school, I remember having that because I was still in the era where corporal punishment was allowed in schools. So we were regularly hit one way or the other. Um, and, you know, I can laugh about it now, but it would be horrific for people to think about that. And that's been a massive sea change in schools in this in this country. You know, it is interesting to bring a, a light point to quite a serious topic of, of corporal punishment. I mean, I have a friend who always tells the story of um, growing up and he pushed his little brother outside with his trousers down and into a garage sale with lots of different people. And so as punishment, his mother went and got a paddle, um, you know, one of those with a ball that you could just hit for hours on end. Um, they said, Jesus loves me on it and just spanked him real hard, broke the paddle. But there is something painful, isn't there, <laughs> about the fact that discipline has been taken over by punishment. The word itself comes from the Latin to teach or to learn, instruction and training. And I'm just wondering whether we've lost the real sense of what discipline is. And today, in, in terms of technology and the sort of the revolution of uh, social media, how much that's changing our understanding of discipline? Yeah, I mean, I was quite interested about the, uh, the constellation between discipline and motivation. I mean, you've touched on the religious aspect of discipline. And certainly there was a whole thing around um, certainly all my Catholic friends. <laughs> um, and I lived in an area that was Jewish and Catholic and C of E kind of went one on each house really in, in rotation. But my Catholic friends, they had very severe uh, kind of parents who did, you know, instill much more what I call of that kind of incident that you talked about, you know, being hit as a kind of form of this will teach you. The trouble with all of that, if we look at it neurologically, is it can in its extreme create fear. And I think what happens is you're then teaching people that violence is the language to use to mediate conflict or difficulty. And we've moved away from that considerably in, in the West, I think, and moved towards the idea that actually we should be trying to train, instruct, drill, mediate, negotiate and set firm boundaries, which is very different. But actually, self-discipline, if we move on to that is really important because most of us get motivated quite strongly by certain things at certain points, but we lose motivation. So, you know, the three of us have probably worked in situations where you're thrilled for a while in a topic or a subject or working with a group of people, and then actually it becomes quite hard. But you, as a leader in particular, but anybody in any situation in a group, have to maybe take responsibility personally about keeping that going, and that requires self-discipline. So I think there's some interesting... Uh, crossovers here between different words that we use to describe aspects of discipline. So I think you just described my experience doing a PhD uh, and maybe perhaps <laughs> most PhD students is you start off all excited and you're quite regimented and then as the years go by and the work grinds on you, you find it incredibly difficult. It's also interesting I mean the digital point was touched and how that affects um, discipline and I think this really shows the power of sport in education and I didn't play sport growing up. Uh, I come from the world where f American football is king. And if you want to be popular, you play football. But actually, you know, even though I didn't partake in it, you can really see the intrinsic value of it, especially now in, in an area of kind of heightened individualism through a screen is, you know, you have a team of coaches. So you have a relationship and a mentor um, with a coach who maybe only has 10 other players that he's looking after. It's it's a schedule, it's regiment, it's exercise, and you're always building towards something. And it's about community. Um, and not only the community within your team, but the fact that where I grew up, everyone goes out to watch the game on Friday night. You know, we talked about how discipline as a punishment, but I think often we, we need to think about discipline in terms of formation. And I think this is largely structured and, and shaped by my own PhD research. I was studying how people study, which seems kind of like locked into a loop, but I studied theological education, and I think maybe the last great example of discipline in a number of ways. So we have learning by rote, you have exams, you have memorization, 
but you also have a very strong formational element attached to that. So it's paideia, which is this formation, this learning, this mentorship, and Weissenschaft, which is this more educational logic, this learning. And seminaries, I think more than any other educational institution, are wrestling with these two concepts of figuring out where do we actually fall between the two. And, you know, there's there's a long debate in Europe and the U.S., where I did my studies between Christianity and Judaism. How do we navigate that difficult path? But I think more than the educational system of just you and me and anyone else who's, who's not going into theological education, it has something about formation within it. It has habits built in. It has, you know, disciplines of of prayer, but also of study and of services. And so I do wonder if that offers us a model um, of discipline in the 21st century. Yeah, those boundaries are really critical, aren't they? We're talking about, about boundaries and habits and, as you described, formation of a way of being. And I guess that starts really early. And I guess it, much of it depends on how you parented. So um, how did they manage conflict and what did they use to discipline us, you know, with greater degrees of success and failure probably along the way? You made an interesting point with that last example. And it's, you know, the, the time limit of a disciplinary process or a, a formative process. And I think back to my own life and thinking about the discipline that my community put in and the way that they were shaping me. But the fact that eventually they, they wouldn't let go of those structures. You know, we weren't allowed to then take off from the runway, so to speak. And, 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 and this is an interesting question of how long do you discipline for? Obviously, discipline is a lifelong process, but it looks in different ways at different points in our lives. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about is that what is the wisdom in knowing when this form of discipline needs to stop and the person needs to move on? I wonder also, Austin, whether you could apply some of that learning about those stages, if you like, to the work that you're doing in Jerusalem, because you're working with Christian churches in one of the most contested areas of the old city, that is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, and you were just an outsider, and you're American. How did you hold together the self-discipline and actually feel you were making a contribution? Because I know from my experience, um, it's not easy. Sometimes you, you spend most of the time actually biting your tongue, or at least I do. What can you share with the listeners before we go into a break? I think so much about discipline is actually just listening. And I think so much discipline is controlling the tongue. The self-discipline of knowing when to speak, I think, is incredibly important. And I think especially as you're an outsider coming in when you're seeking to understand. And in terms of complexity, I think we see this in education. You, you learn, you absorb before you then start, you know, critically analyzing or, or, or giving back in that way. And in the context like Jerusalem, so as you said, Ed, we do lots of work with the churches who inevitably are walking a very fine line. One of the leaders is appointed by the Knesset and the PA and the Jordanians. You can imagine, you know, how carefully they have to walk. It's learning about what their stories are and also what their boundaries are. I mean, how do they discipline themselves in the way we talk about these topics or the way that they navigate certain complexities? I guess what you're talking about there is the, is the listening piece, but also the reflecting back what you hear and not trying to change people, but to offer them something else as a possibility. This is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests are Julian Stanley and Austin Tiffany, and our subject is discipline. There's a gag during the rounds of teachers which has a fictional pupil say, I don't know the facts, but I think I can explain their significance. And the mastery of facts, let alone the notion of learning by heart, seems to have been trumped by a thirst for theoretical speculation. Perhaps we should rethink this. Here's Ali Ali on the Naked Reflection show Memory and Memorizing. I grew up in a Muslim household where the study and memorization of the Quran were essential parts of my formation as a young Muslim. To my Quran teachers, it was more important that I committed chapters of the Quran to memory before I could learn like, to understand the meaning of the text. Ali was talking about learning by rote as commonly implemented in a strictly religious household. Um, Julian, you've worked with strictly religious across different faiths. What's your view of learning by rote? Well, I'm a little bit old fashioned about this because I actually think there is a place for it. I think it's I don't, I don't think it's the best way to teach and learn in many respects. But if we think about learning languages, you have to repeat. And, you know, to learn verbs, nouns in different uh, languages, you've got to kind of do that repetition work. I, I always remember with my own children um, not wanting them to go to school, not knowing their times tables 
because when I went to school, I always used to get picked on to do the nine times table and I couldn't do it, you know, so I'd be in fear of every lesson, you know, being chosen to kind of what are nine nines and I'd freeze, you know, and then you'd get usually hit with a ruler if you couldn't do it. With the kids, what I did was we would do it by row at bath time. So I had three under two, so they were all in the bath together at the same time. We would have them on the wall, but we would sing them. And we would sing them by rote. And they went to school knowing their tables. So, I mean, you know, that is an example of where I felt teaching by rote, you could be creative about it and you could do it in a way that wasn't kind of boring and horrible and wasn't seen as a chore, but actually was going to be useful. If we just think that alone is a technique of teaching, then we're going to miss out on the possibility of enabling children to fulfil their potential. Learning by rote, that's something that's quite, uh, uh, quite common in the Middle East, Austin. I think particularly within Islam, reciting the Quran is obviously very important. But I think, you know, that there's a tradition of that in other traditions, uh, other faiths as well. You know, I I remember some of my Mormon friends growing up who spent every single morning in intense study before they even got to school um, in religious education. I grew up in a tradition of Bible quizzes, you know, how do they having to rattle off the order of the Bible, you know, uh, under pressure. There are traces of this throughout a number of religious traditions. And again, I think I go back to my point. You know, I see their importance, but to what extent do you need to move past that? Uh, At what point do you need to start critically analyzing? And and I'm not totally convinced that learning by rote gives you the necessary skills to critically analyze a faith tradition or a text. In speaking from my own experience, you know, I could I could tell you kind of the order of the parables or the exact journey that Paul took on his first missionary trip. I'm not sure that did anything to help me understand the meaning behind the parable. Um, If anything, it just kind of showed me, oh, well, I know I can look up in Acts chapter four for the story. I'm going to stand up for a bit of discipline by rote, okay, (laughs) a bit of learning by rote, um, because I wonder if it truly is inhibiting. As an artist, you have to repeat the same tasks over and over, which is paradoxical, isn't it, in a creative person, but necessary. One of my early careers was I was in the theatre and, you know, you had to be able to learn things and, you know, that would involve repetition, really. So it's actually, it's a really important skill, actually, to repeat things. And it's important to to remember that there are things that you don't want to learn that you might need to learn. So in science, you've got the elemental tables and so on and so forth. Um, certainly when I went to a Jewish school, you were expected to learn certain prayers so that you knew them. What I always found bizarre was that nobody talked about what they meant. Uh, which is really probably what we're talking about. So learning by rote is a skill and it's a useful skill. But I think, you know, meaning around what we're learning, what things mean and why do they matter and why do they matter to the community? Why do they matter to a wider society? Why do they matter to you? I think those things are really important um, about values, about belief, about difference and what that might mean for each of us and how we navigate the world. These are really important things that you can't teach by road. Yeah, and I think also what comes to mind is not only resuscitating a text or a prayer, but it's learning by rote in terms of practices as well. So with the work that I do in Jerusalem, I had the opportunity to visit Mar Saba, which is a very, very ancient monastery um, in the West Bank. And speaking to some of the monks there and just learning about their schedule of habits and prayers and services that is every day. But speaking to them about how that forms them, uh, and not not only how it forms them in in their monastic life, but also how incredibly challenging it is. And so it isn't just all positive, but but they they tackle this challenge as a necessary part of their spiritual journey. We can find that throughout the religious traditions. And way beyond the Abrahamic faiths, of course, as you were speaking, Austin, I was thinking of the Far East, you know, and, and silent retreats and, and those sorts of disciplines, which are equally challenging. Meditation is a kind of challenge, isn't it? You know, so Buddhist meditation, any form of meditation is probably a challenge because most of us kind of run from thought to thought. But learning to control our thinking or to control our minds and quieten our minds so that we can follow through on our thoughts or focus in particular areas is, again, a skill that we all have to kind of learn and relearn. And we're constantly relearning in different ways, I think, through our lifetimes. I'd like to move the conversation on to a different aspect of discipline, and that's military discipline. If there's one group that has the thread of discipline running through it, it is, of course, the the military units. Yet the the line, I was only following orders, is not a defense uh, for any war crimes or any trial. 
It's a real conundrum, that, because, yes, soldiers are trained to follow orders. And at what point does individual conscience come into play? And that's incredibly difficult. So we've seen that through, you know, the Nazi war trials and so on and so forth. You know, where, as you say, people will say, well, I was only doing what I was told. But at what point do we have to think, actually, that's not good enough? That's incredibly difficult. And, you know, we, we hear about the people who followed. I mean, I guess that's the trouble with regimes, if you like, because the more you have a authoritarian approach in a society, the more likely it is that people will lose the ability to think for themselves and make an alternative choice. And I think authoritarianism in any form, whether it's in parenting, you know, is really problematic. Now, of course, we need the forces. We've seen in recent times with Ukraine, we've seen what's gone on here and the bravery of certain people defending their territories. So we've seen in our lifetimes, in a way we never expected to see, certainly, you know, I've always thought myself very lucky to have lived through most of my life with, you know, no conflict on the horizon in Europe. And here we are on our doorstep with that. And I'm all for people defending um, their right to their own cultures and existence. I think that's really, really important. But how do we mediate that about what's actually possible and doable? And I think this is about the problem really with military training because it's very fixated on you follow a particular regime, you follow a particular set of orders. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. My dad went to military school and uh, as a kid, I kind of translated that as, oh, that's why he was so particular about the way I made up my bed every morning. And that was kind of as, as far as I connected the dots on that. But I think I think it is an interesting question and, and I, I don't think I have an answer in you know, what is that line in the military? But I do find it particularly interesting in the context of democracies, because in a democracy, at least the way I view it, is, you know, your um, elected representative should be disciplined by their constituents. Um, they should be guided uh, and informed with the way they vote and the way they behave should be formed by the will of those who voted them into power. And obviously, then if you rise the ranks, then you become head of the armed forces and then you have basically turned that on its head and then you're creating a whole structure that is very kind of top down but at the same time you know in moments of national importance or of crisis that's exactly what you want because you need clear communication and you need boundaries as you were speaking i was thinking about your comment earlier in the podcast about the different stages that you went through and at what stage you can leave the discipline imposed by your family or your school. And I wonder whether there's something there in as society moves into a different stage, like a war footing where more is expected of citizens to defend the state. You know, maybe it is about identifying these different stages, whether it's a personal development or a community development or even a national development. I think that's important in terms of people's individual values as well, and also what we describe as normative values in a society. So what do we value? What do we think is important? What do we want to teach about peace and conflict, about the need for violence when it's required? I remember interviewing uh, Nick Carter, who was previously the head of the armed services, and he was talking about that decisions could be made by soldiers over and against their orders if it crossed a certain line. So maybe one of the things that's coming out of this conversation is to identify what those lines are when you can move from a disciplinary stage to a new stage or some new aspect of discipline just as much as in life we move to those new stages. Yeah, and I think the whole piece you said about ethics is critical actually, particularly for the military because, you know, many of us in the general public will not know that what the boundaries and the rules are and we just assume a great deal it's a really important area in the uk political parties have whips to keep collective discipline yet we deride lobby fodder mps but how could governments work without some sort of collective discipline julian well, I guess when we think about politicians, organisations, governments, there has to be collective responsibility at some point. So you can't all agree all of the time. Uh, and so consensus has to be reached or someone has to make a decision and actually say that's the direction of travel. And so that is a requirement of government. But I think that's slightly different than the whips, which tend to use, you know, certainly in our UK parliament, they tend to use kind of personal information as a means to kind of control people. Because, you know, in this sense, discipline is about control. You know, if you do, if you don't do this or vote this way, we will reveal X about your personal life. And that's typically what might happen. And some are more able to resist 
exists in others, depending on where they are in the pecking order. So if we look at uh, uh, governments, we often see prime ministers or leaders in any country fall foul of the rules. So if we look back in history in America and others, Nixon and so on, we can see again and again that frailty around sticking to the rules, around being disciplined, around collective responsibility or around corruption uh, easily emerge. So it's important that we have ethics and it's important that we kind of keep coming back to that. And I think we could argue that potentially that's something we've not seen a great deal of in the UK in recent years. I'm sorry, but... I have to be strict about the duration of this podcast. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks to my guests, Julian Stanley and Austin Tiffany. And thanks to you two for listening. If you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, you might want to browse our archive of podcasts. We'll be on holiday soon, but don't worry. We will soon be sharing our biggest hits during our August break. So keep an eye out for that too. 